So before I get started, um, I want to mention, so the talk after mine uh, is going to be by Don, and he's going to talk about uh, quantum game theory, shorter talk. Uh, we're not going to have, there will be some introduction material there, but we're not going to go through a, a, a complete tutorial because a lot of the topics that were in the tutorial have been covered by Jerome and Joyce. But I have posted on the website now a, a short tutorial paper. So if you go to the conference agenda, you can download that paper and read it. Um, and so we'll have uh, Don's presentation, and then we'll have sort of an open discussion uh, before the conference dinner. So I'm going to talk about order effects. So I'm first going to explain what order effects are and why we would want to use quantum probability theory to model them. And I'm going to turn to talk about some uh, experiments in inference, examining order effects in a criminal uh, inference uh, design, and then I'm going to look at some models of order effects. I'm going to look at a quantum model and also at uh, some uh, more traditional models, which are add, adding and averaging models. And then I'm going to end with talking about some new ideas that I have about causal reasoning, talk about some uh, preliminary experiments, and also then some future directions in this work. So let's suppose that you are a juror and you have to judge the guilt of some uh, criminal suspect. And so you see, you hear the prosecution's case, and then you, the defense presents their case, and then you have to make a judgment of guilt. We well, might think, well, we could switch the order of the prosecution and the defense. So maybe the defense presents first, and then the prosecution, and then you have to make a judgment of guilt. An order effect occurs when that judgment of guilt is not the same in both situations. So that it depends on whether you saw the defense and then the prosecution, or the prosecution, and then the defense. Order effects arise in a number of situations in psychology, um, in mock trials. Uh, they've been found in medical decision-making tasks, um, and even more uh, abstract tasks where you're asked to judge uh, probabilities about drawing balls from urns. Yes? Can I ask a question about trials? When I think of whoever goes second, they get to refer to whoever goes first. So a clean order effect test is that each, each party records their speech separately. And then you, right, so in a real trial, go? there is a very specific order in which things happen. So you wouldn't actually have this sort of scenario when you're flipping them. So this is a kind of a very abstract example. And I'm going. So, so the possibility that the second person has more ammunition. Right, so I mean there's explain a. Explain why they do better. That is one reason. So yes, so in, the, in an actual trial, they can refer to the other person, and it is in a set order. But if we think about this very abstract situation where they don't refer to each other, and they're independent, then we can think about them switching the order. And that just the manipulation of switching those um, pieces of sort of independent information causes this if you order find effect. It with tape recorded speeches. Sure. Really mm -hmm. Or listening to two CDs in order which you listen to them. Yes. Right, and we'll talk about some uh, experiments in this domain in which we have people read scenarios and they don't refer to each other. So more formally, we say that an order effect would occur if the probability of guilt given the prosecution than the defense is not equal to the probability of guilt given the defense than the prosecution. So these order effects are difficult for simple Bayesian models because the events in these simple Bayesian models do not contain order information and they commute. So you would have the probability of guilt given the prosecution and then the defense is equal to the probability of guilt given the defense and the prosecution. Now I can build a Bayesian model that can produce order effects. <laughs> One way to do it, and there's probably many other ways to do it, would be to introduce order information. So I would have to introduce something like event 01 that the prosecution is presented before the defense, or event 02 that the, the defense was presented before the prosecution. And in this situation, now I can get an order effect so that the prosecution followed by the defense doesn't produce the same thing as the defense followed by the prosecution. However, I want to argue that I'm simply just re-describing the data when I do this particular way of building a Bayesian model. So I've said, well, here's the order, and I'm building the order information in, 
instead of trying to explain where the order effects are coming from. Also, in most of these experiments and in the experiments I'm going to talk about, order information was irrelevant. So the, the participants weren't giving any instructions about order of information. They, weren't, um, they had no reason to assume that there was one piece would be more salient than the other just because of the presentation order. I'd like to argue that quantum probability theory provides a natural way to model order effects. And there's two key principles of the quantum probability theory that I'm going to harness um, in order to explain these order effects. One is compatibility, which we've already heard quite a bit about, and the other related idea is unicity. So in quantum probability theory, we can have events that are compatible and incompatible. Compatible events um, are events that can be realized simultaneously. And so there, we would say that these events have no order information. They commute with each other. Incompatible events are events that cannot be realized simultaneously. And we think of these events as being processed sequentially. So in this first case, we can have a joint event. So if we have event A and B, we can think about the event A and B. In incompatible events, so if we have A and B, what we think about is the event A and then B. So that there's a sequential processing of information. Now classical probability theory is typically thought to deal with these compatible events here. So that you have these joint events and that the events commute. Quantum probability theory allows for compatible and incompatible events. So it's this use of incompatible events is how we're going to explain order effects because incompatible events provide a natural way to talk about a sequential processing of events. A related principle of quantum probability theory is um, related to unicity. So classical probability theory obeys the principle of unicity. So the idea is that there is a single space that provides a complex and exhaustive description of all events. The quantum probability theory will allow you to have multiple sample spaces that are related to each other in a coherent way. And it's the incompatible events that are represented by separate sp sample spaces. So we can think about, in a very simple case, is I would maybe have this sample space here, and the events in, within the sample space are um, compatible with one another. I have another sample space here. The events in this particular sample space would be compatible with each other. But when I compare <coughs> the two sample spaces, those events are incompatible. And they're related to each other by a unitary operator. So they have this nice relationship for, so that I can move from one sample space to another. So just a simple example to illustrate this idea. Let's think that I have two events. I have a voting event and an ideology event. So if we think back to the November election, perhaps I say, how are you going to vote? And you can tell me one of three things. You can say I'm going to vote um, Democratic, Republican, or Independent. Or I might ask you, what is your political ideology? And you might respond one of three ways, liberal, conservative, or moderate. Now we could treat these two events, the voting event and the ideology event, as incompatible. And what this means mathematically is we're going to represent these events as two different bases for a three-dimensional vector space. So for the voting um, events, I'm going to have three outcomes, Democratic, Republican, and Independent, and those are going to correspond to the basis vectors for one basis of my vector space. So here, this is the blue basis. Well, I can also have my ideology bases made up of the basis vectors corresponding to liberal, conservative, and moderate which are my red bases here. And then there's a nice way to relate the voting bases to the ideology bases, and that's through a unitary operator. So I apply my unitary operator to my voting bases, and I get my ideology bases. So here I basically have a small sample space dealing with voting. I have one talking about political ideology, and I'm relating them through this unitary operator. So what if these two things are compatible? So what would that representation look like? This would be the classical probability representation. So I'd have my events, Democratic, Republican, um, and Independent, Liberal, Conservative, and Moderate. And then I could form all the joint events and assign probabilities to those. 
so that I have an event such as Democratic and Liberal, Democratic and Conservative, Republican and Conservative, et cetera. And this would form a large nine-dimensional sample space. So in the previous slide, when they were incompatible, I had a three-dimensional vector space. So by using incompatible events, I'm reducing the size of the space that I'm working in. So when I'm using compatible events, I'm going to be working in a larger space. So quantum probability theory does not require probabilities to be assigned to all joint events. So if two events are incompatible, then I don't have to assign them a joint event. Incompatible events will ultimately result in a low dimensional vector space. So if I have compatible events, I'm going to end up with a higher dimensional space. And I want to argue that this provides a simple and efficient way to evaluate, evaluate events within human processing capabilities. So we might think that, well, in this simple example, nine joint events is not that many, but if we extrapolate and think about more complicated everyday problems when there's lots of events out there in the world, then if we have to form all the joint events of those um, events, then we're going to end up with a very large sample space in which we have to define a probability distribution over. The quantum model is saying we can reduce the size of the space to something smaller and then talk about ways of how these sample spaces are related to each other. And in this way, we're reducing the size of the space, which I'd like to argue is perhaps more within the human uh, processing capabilities. So this is um, one of the questions that has been asked is, when are events compatible versus incompatible? And I don't have a great answer, but I hypothesize that incompatible representations are adopted in um, at least one of two situations. So the first one would be when situations are uncertain and individuals don't have a wealth of past experience. So if you don't have a lot of experience about a bunch of events, then it would be difficult to form a compatible representation of those events. The other would be when information is provided by different sources with different points of view. So for example, with the prosecution and defense, these are two very different points of view about the same um, uh, criminal case. And that information, particularly if you're not familiar with the information in the case, then those, those pieces of information could form incompatible representations. So these are different points of view in which you treat um, in an incompatible way. I'm going to turn now and talk about some uh, experiments that I ran in a criminal uh, inference paradigm. So the first experiment looked at order effects in criminal inference. This was with a lot of subjects. We had about 291 people in the subject. And what we did was we had them read fictitious criminal cases and report the likelihood of the defendant's guilt um, as a probability between zero and one. And we had them do it at three points in time. So we had them do this before reading either case. So we just gave them some preliminary information. And then we had them uh, give a probability judgment after reading either the prosecution or the defense, so one of the cases. And then we had them do it a third time after re reading the remaining case. We allowed for two strengths levels for each case. We allowed cases to be strong and to be weak. So we'd have a strong prosecution or a weak prosecution, a strong defense and a weak defense. And this provides a eight total possible sequential judgments. So we have two cases, prosecution, defense, two orders, prosecution followed by defense and vice versa. And then also two strengths, strong and weak. So just a help bring this home. So here's one of the scenarios that we used in this experiment. So this was People versus Robbins. Um, and so they would read an indictment. It would say the defendant, Janice Robbins, is charged with stealing a motor vehicle. And then they were given some basic facts. They said on the night of June the 10th, a blue Oldsmobile was stolen from the quick sell car lot. The defendant was arrested the following day after the police received an anonymous tip. And so after they read this sort of introductory material, they then ask, what is the probability that Janice Robbins is guilty? And most people at this point will respond about 0.5. We always get those couple of people who really take home that innocent to proven guilty, <laughs> and they say zero. But 90% of our subjects say around 0.5. And then we present them with either the prosecution or the defense. 
and we either present them with a strong prosecution or a weak prosecution. This is an example of the weak prosecution. So here the weak prosecution says security cameras at the quick sell car lot have footage of a woman matching Robin's descriptions driving the blue Oldsmobile from the lot on the night of June 10th. So it's just this one piece of information that they get for the um, weak prosecution. And for the strong prosecution, we give them two more pieces of information. So they receive the same piece of information here, and then they would get these two if they were seeing the um, strong prosecution. So here it's during the day on June 10th, Robbins had come to the quick sell car lot and had talked to Vincent Brown, the owner, about buying the blue Oldsmobile but left without purchasing the car. The car was found outside the Dollar General. Robbins is an employee of the Dollar General. So after this, we asked them now, what is the probability that Janice Robbins is guilty? And most people increase their probability of guilt because I've given them some evidence that she might be guilty. Was this instead of the first or in, in addition to the first? Um, Were those two bullets in place? So they the saw either one. one Did you add them or replace them? So this was different conditions. So, uh, so this is between subjects. So some people would see strong and other people would see weak. There wouldn't be added information. And then they might see the defense's case. And this would be an example of a weak defense. So maybe they um, saw this uh, sentence that said, Robin's roommate Beth Stahl was, was with Robin's at home on the night of June 10th. Stahl claims that Robin's never left their home. So this is the weak defense. And then some people in a different condition would see the strong defense, which would say that Robbins uh, recently inherited a large sum of money. While interested in acquiring a new car, she has no reason to steal one. And Robbins has no criminal record. So after now seeing the defense, either the strong or the weak, we would ask them to make another probability judgment in, um, of Janice Robbins' guilt. And usually we saw a decrease in the probability of guilt after seeing the defense, because there's evidence for innocence here. So this one is weak, and we just add information to make it stronger. So basically, we are following an experimental design by McKinsey, Lee, and Chen, where they base, so weak is one bullet point, and strong is three bullet points. Oh, right. So uh, we use the same design. We had eight different scenarios, and we use the same sort of setup for all of the scenarios. So here are the results. What you're looking at in the four plots um, are the different combinations of cases. So this is strong defense, strong prosecution, strong defense, weak prosecution, weak defense, strong prosecution, and weak defense, weak prosecution. And then we're looking at the probability judgments at the three points in time, before either case, after the first case, and after both cases. The, Red bar is the situation where the prosecution is presented first, followed by the defense. The blue uh, dotted line here is the um, defense presented first, followed by the prosecution. So what you'll notice in all of these graphs is that there's this cross at the end here. If there was no order effect, then the probability judgment after both cases would be on the same point. So the blue and the red lines would be on the same point. And what we see is that they are not. And we see this cross in the lines. And what this means is that people are showing a recency order effect. So they're putting more weight on the most recent piece of information that they read. And this happens in all of the four um, combinations. So I'm going to now turn and talk about uh, some models of, yes? Can you, can you just say a word about it? I mean, so that, that recency interpretation seems, it's a good description, but it also suggests an alternative explanation, which is just a memory effect. We don't think there's any memory effects here, uh, because everything was presented very quickly. And, they, and we ran different versions of this experiment where we gave them the option to go back and read. Like they could push a button, and they could go back and read something. Most people don't do that. But um, there's also been some work. Uh, I think Reed Hastie's has worked on this, where he's looked at these sort of sequential judgments, and they haven't. They think that they're online effects, and they have n nothing to do, at least when the presentation is in rapid succession, that they're not due to memory effects. Did, did you then think of was the second scenario, the second one you presented, or the la the last one that was presented to him, or the last one they looked at? You gave me A, B, and then I looked at A. Um, so this is the last one we presented to them. Um, even, so we ran, so this is from an experiment where we didn't give them the option to go back 
Um, but even in those cases, most people don't. Um, we have no reason to think that they wouldn't be able to remember the information. It's a short amount of information and very quickly presented. Which is, is a recency effect, what, which is the independent variable, which is the most recent if I do A, B, A. That's all. Um, so if they were to go back, I don't know if we would get a recency effect in that situation. So, yeah. Um, oftentimes it depends. So you can, there's two types of word effects. You can get recency and primacy effects. And it really depends on a couple of things, how long the sequence is and how much information there is in each piece of information. So you get different effects in different situations. So I don't know if you were to string more of these together if you would end up with a recency effect. I'm going to talk about, um, well, really three models of order effects. Um, the first two are different versions of the belief adjustment model. And these two versions um, are an adding model and an averaging model. So they're just different assumptions that you make in the model and you end up with an adding or an averaging model. And then I'm also going to talk about a quantum inference model, which is going to account for order effects by transforming a state vector with different sequences of operators for different orderings of information. So this is the belief adjustment model um, by Hogarth and Einhorn. So it basically <coughs> assumes that you have this CK here, which is the degree of belief in the defendant's guilt after case K. And that's equal to the degree of belief in guilt after the previous case, plus the difference between a strength of the current case and a reference point, which is then weighted by this um, a certain parameter here. So for example, if we had the defense followed by the prosecution, the probability of guilt um, after reading the defense would equal the probability of guilt after the prob um, prosecution, plus some weighted difference of the strength of the defense and this reference point. So like I said, you can get two versions of this model, an adding and an averaging model. And that really depends on how the reference point is defined and how the adjustment weights are defined. So you can define them in different ways to end up with an adding model and then an averaging model. And the case here refers to the prosecution case or the defendant case in that sense case? Mm -hmm. Yes. So whatever they saw the, in their um, sequence of information. So the quantum inference model assumes that there's two hypotheses, guilty and not guilty, and that the prosecution can present evidence for guilt. So we have positive evidence. And we also have negative evidence, and that the defense would present this negative evidence. So then we think that there can be these four patterns. We can have guilty and evidence for guilt, guilty and evidence for innocence, not guilty and evidence for guilt, not guilty and evidence for innocence. So those are four patterns that we're going to um, hypothesize and use to define a four-dimensional vector space. We're then going to think that the juror considers three points of view when making judgments in this task. They have this neutral point of view, which is associated with that initial description that they read. They read the indictment and then some facts about the case that the Blue Oats mobile was stolen. Janice Robbins was arrested on anonymous tip. And then we have a point of view associated with the prosecution and the defense. So we're going to treat these different points of view as incompatible um, because these different points of view, they're different sources of information and so we want to hypothesize that they are treated as incompatible. So we have different basis vectors for the three different points of view. So we have bases um, associated with the neutral point of view, a basis associated with the prosecution's point of view, and a basis associated with the defense's point of view. So we have three different bases for a four-dimensional space that we're working with. So we're going to relate these different bases, or we can think about these as well as small sample spaces. So we're relating these small sample spaces or bases by a unitary transformation. And this is going to allow us to relate the different points of view to one another and kind of correspond to how an in individual might shift their perspective when thinking about this problem. So here we have this neutral point of view that you might start with. And then if I show you the defense first, we're going to chain, you're going to use the neutral basis to answer um, the question about guilt here. And then after I show you the defense, you would change your basis and use the defense's basis to produce a judgment of guilt. And then if you see the prosecution in the last spot, then you would change your basis again and use um, the prosecution basis for your judgment of guilt. 
In a similar way, if I present the prosecution first, then you'll use those bases and then rotate and use the defense's bases last. So boom. Um, adding a bit of mathematics here. So suppose the prosecution is going to present positive evidence favor and guilt and you see the prosecution first. So we think that we're going to start in this neutral state here, the omegas. So this is our neutral basis from our neutral point of view that we get from that initial piece of information that we read. And then when the prosecution is, when you read the prosecution, we're now going to change and rotate the bases so that we're using the bases associated with the prosecution's point of view. Well, we're going to assume that the prosecution, the prosecutor is good and they're going to present um, evidence uh, favoring guilt. And so at this point, we're going to project this belief state onto the subspace for positive evidence. So that's, what that's going to do is pick off the first and the third component of the vector. And so this is now our new belief state for the prosecution. And at this point, if I want to get a probability of guilt, I would normalize the projection and then I would project onto the guilty subspace. So that will pick out this point. And I essentially am taking that amplitude and I'm taking the modulus and squaring it. Well, now suppose the defense presents evidence uh, favoring. So can, can I just ask something because you there's a lot of overlap between uh, quantum physics and quantum cognition. Axioms are very similar and so on, but here you have completely left physics. It appears that the subject can report amplitudes. We are... You're asking in probability judgments. So in this state, alpha H, uh, alpha 1 plus and 0, alpha 2 plus 0. The subject is reading off the first amplitude. That's yeah, 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 square and normalize and so on. But that, you know, that's determined, right? So, right. So you take a probability, you know the state of the subject. You know the normalized state. Right, so we're modeling their probabilistic judgments here. And this would be a similar thing that would happen in a classical model. I could have built a, a yes, larger dimensional space and those probabilities would still be representing, those amplitudes there, would still are, represent probabilities. There are two questions in, in my mind. First of all, we all agree you've left the domain of physics behind. You can't ask an electron, tell me, tell me your amplitude, no. <laughs> right? No. You can ask an electron, what's your spin? I mean, it has to say yes or no. I can't tell you the spin's point six probability of point four probability. That's right. Yeah. Unless you have a lot of electrons, <laughs> right? But you're probably so, actually asking the Langer question. It's kind, of a, it's a kind of a discussion question. I understand what well, the other, the other like issue is, is, why can't you ask the subject right at the very beginning, tell me all of your amplitudes? If you can ask him at one point what, what well, the amplitude, why not? Well, we would think that not? later information is going to well, cause I know they're going the to change state to evade, with information, evolve. but you're giving a subject a particular ability. So would you be happier if I let these be free parameters and fit these to the data? I, I mean, it's not a question of being happy. It's a question of what? <laughs> well, but if you ask them at the beginning, they'd be using right. the omegas. So they would be using yeah. a different, I mean. Yeah. They even ask them at the beginning. Tell, tell me your state. But you would only get, yeah, you would get the. Uh, I mean, I could I formulate questions is, that ask. I don't think the subject knows that they're in a four-dimensional <laughs> space. They don't know that the, the, the whole experiment is going to be described as a tensor product of two two-dimensional spaces. They don't know this. I mean, I can ask them these questions, and then, I mean, I could also just allow these to be free parameters, which I fit later. What, um, what would 
what would you ask a subject initially? Give me your prediction of guilt accompanied by weak evidence for guilt. You could ask, yeah, you could formulate this question. Do you think that they would give you coherent answers that would match the initial state and its structure as a complex four vector whose sums of squares add to one and so on? I don't think so. Well, the judgment, there's a, there's a mapping from your state to the judgment. We all have non-linear non measurements of judgment. I have no problem with, with you being in charge in the same way that physicists write states for electrons or photons and so on, and they make all kinds of uh, amazing predictions. It's not something the electron knows about. I mean, I, yeah, we better move on, but I agree with you. I understand your point. It's a good point for discussion, too, but, and we need to address this, but better, maybe better, better. Yeah, I think we should. This is yeah, so we're going to have more discussion at the end. Besides that, uh, you don't know that the electron doesn't know about it. Nobody's asking the electron. Maybe he's talking. All right, so we're going to continue on. So now the defense has presented their um, in, uh, information. And so what we think is that the prosecution, your state of belief, so now changes to the defense species. And then you're going to reject on negative evidence because the defense should present negative evidence for guilt. And at this point, we would normalize um, the projection and project onto the guilty subspace to calculate the probability of guilt. So in total, the model uses four parameters. And these are used to define the unitary transformation. So there's four different possible cases that we have in this experiment. It's Strong prosecution, weak prosecution, strong defense. Weak prosecution, those four parameters are associated with those cases. So these are just some example fits. Here on the bottom, what you're looking at is the averaging model. So this is one of the versions of the belief adjustment model. The um, dotted red and blue, that's the data. And the model is in the black and the purple. And what you see here is that the averaging model can get the um, qualitative recency effect. So we can get this crossover, but it doesn't provide a good quantitative fit to the data. It seems to misfit the data quite a bit in both situations. And this is representative. The other um, cases looked very similar to this. The quantum model, on the other hand, not only can provide um, a good qualitative um, uh, results here, but it can also uh, provide a much better quantitative fit to the data. There's a little misfitting here, but other than that, you can see that the data and the model seem to be matching up pretty well. So we fit these three models, the averaging and adding, so the two belief, aver um, a belief adjustment models and the quantum model, um, they were fit to 12 data points because that's how much data we got in this experiment. And this is across these eight crime scenarios. And for all three models, they have the same number of parameters. They each have four parameters. And then we looked at the R squared values for the three models. So the averaging model had an R squared of about 0.76. The adding model was quite good. The R squared was 0.98. And the quantum model was also quite good at 0.98. So we can kind of rule out the averaging model for right now and focus on these two, the adding and the quantum model. So we need a new experiment to distinguish between the quantum and adding models. And I came up with this experiment with this irrefutable defense. And basically, in this situation, we have a prosecution that is strong, but a defense that's irrefutable. So it went something like this. The indictment was the defendant, Paul Jackson, is charged with robbing an art museum. <coughs> and the facts were, on December 12th, a burglar broke into the Central City Art Museum. The alarm at the museum notified police of the break-in at 8 p.m. that night. Paul Jackson was arrested the next day when the police arrived, uh, received an anonymous tip. They then, um, so half the subjects would then see the prosecution followed by the defense. The other half would see the defense first and then the prosecution. The prosecution's case was designed to be moderately strong. And it said that Jackson frequently visited this Central City Art Museum. 
and a security guard told police he saw a man matching Jackson's description near the museum around 8 p.m. on the night of the burglary. Another witness told police that they saw a man matching the defendant's description running from the museum a little after 8 p.m. So this was meant to increase the probability of guilt after they read this. So we asked them again to provide a probability of guilt um, judgment after the initial description, uh, when they read the first case and after the second case. They then read this irrefutable defense. So Jackson was teaching a class on the opposite side of town at Central City University between 7 and 9 p.m. on the night of the burglary. There were 50 students present at his class that evening. And this particular class meets three times a week, and the students are well acquainted with Jackson. Furthermore, Jackson has an identical twin brother who has a criminal record. <laughs> so we included this bit about the twin to make people think that, oh, maybe the twin committed the crime and not Paul Jackson. So what we would assume is that once you read this, you would say very low um, probability of guilt. But if the twin was teaching the class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our undergraduates aren't as clever as you. <laughs> so the quantum model predicts that the prosecution will have a major effect when presented first, but no effect when presented after the irrefutable defense. So after we show them this defense with this twin story, we think that it's going to kind of wipe out whatever we show them next. I'm sorry, why does it predict in that direction? It, it, it predicts, as far as I'm understanding, it predicts that the order can have an effect. Mm -hmm. what, what gave it the prediction that the effect would be in that direction? Um, so we looked at... Um, Is it just that that's what you typically find? No, so we constrained it. So it's after the judgment um, of uh, the... So if you see the prosecution first, and if you have a low probability um, of uh, guilt, or yeah, I'm sorry, if you have a, so if the defense is very strong, is irrefutable, and we allow the prosecution to be reasonably strong, the model will predict that you're going to see this sort of pattern of results. And it has to do with, um, the way we're defining the actual unitary operators so it's in the based model. Based on the order in which the strong versus weak. Is uh, it's, it's right. Model. It's mathematics and projection. Model. So it's the it's the between. sort of interaction between the your um, state belief state and then your unitary operations. In that direction. In this direction. So if right. So if you see the prosecution second it won't have much of an effect at all in when we present it in the other direction. So if it's presented first, then you'll have a major effect. And then because of the way the rotation's happening, then to get to the defense, um, you'll kind of see a bottoming out with the defense. But if you do it the other way, you, it will still kind of flatline. My question is, if you observed that the prosecution had a minor effect when presented first, but a major effect when presented, I'm just going to flip the sign of, this, of the sure. sentence. Would you consider that a refutation of the quantum model? I mean, I haven't, I don't know what the model would predict in that that's situation. My, that's my question. So, right. I'm, I mean, I'd have to go and see what the model would predict. Okay. Um, so maybe it would depend. So the adding model predicts that the prosecution will have the same effect in both situations because it treats the two cases as somewhat independent. So you're getting the strength rating in this model, which is independent of everything else, all of the other cases. And so essentially, it's going to try to predict that the prosecution will have the same effect. So it, it, it kind of averages between the two in order to try to fit the data. And this is the result. So the blue and the red are the data. The black, which is a little hard to see, and the purple are the model. And what's happening here in the belief, this um, adding model, is that the, um, the model is overestimating the probability of guilt when you see the prosecution last. And it's underestimating it when you see it first. So it's trying to compensate for the fact that you get a, a bigger effect when the prosecution comes first 
and a smaller effect to the prosecution when it comes last because it's treating, it has this independent strength in, built into the model. The quantum model doesn't have this problem and can provide a, a much better fit to the data. Because here we see that basically the lines are all overlapping. Yes? Can you tell me what's on the ordinate? So here we've got, so on the x-axis we have um, each of the three judgments. They're making three judgments before either case, after either case. And then here we have the prob probability and guilt. I think it says confidence here. We ran this experiment um, <coughs> um, two different ways. We ran it with uh, probability judgments and also a confidence rating from a zero to 20. Yeah, but those aren't probabilities. Those are confidence ratings, right? Well, we, we, did we did it both ways, and you get right. the same thing. You just told me that these were probabilities. Well, I'm sorry, they're actually confidence, but they're, they're the same. I mean, you get the same result. The model also predicts confidence. So we rescaled these to be probabilities when we fit the model. So these were normalized. Uh, so we replicated some original experiments by McKinsey well, Lee. Are, are you claiming that if you take these confidence ratings and normalize them so that at the uh, top you have one and at the bottom you have zero, at the middle you have 0.5, there's no difference between confidence ratings and probability? Not for this experiment, because we ran it both ways. We actually, so when we designed this experiment, we were trying to replicate a finding by McKinsey, Lee, and Chen, um, which is something they used this particular uh, confidence scale. It was between 0 and 20. And we can never replicate their findings. We started with probability, and we thought that was the problem. Then we moved to confidence, got the same results. And so then we started you know, just using both scales, and we could move between them for this particular experiment for whatever reason. Um, all right, so I'm going to, um, with my remaining time, talk a little bit about some new ideas that I have about causal reasoning. So classical probability models of causal reasoning have been very successful at accounting for numerous phenomena in what I want to call an elemental causal induction. So this is a term coined by Tom Griffiths, which is reasoning about a single cause and effect. And there's been a lot of work, Patricia Chang, Griffiths and Tannenbaum, working with these sorts of models on these simple causal relations. There's <coughs> also a body of literature looking at judgments about more complex causal systems and these judgments often violate the normative rules of classical probability theory. And a lot of this work is um, work done by Steve Sloman and his former postdoc, Phil Fernbach. And so we have a situation where people are good at this um, elemental causal induction. We have probability models that can account for the behavior. But when we move to more complex situations, we don't have models, or at least classical probability models, that can account for some of the phenomena that have been documented. So I was motivated by an idea um, that Phil Fernbach and Steve Sullivan put forward, which was that causal, reason, causal reasoning is structurally local. So when you ask someone about a complex causal situation, individuals focus on single causal relationships rather than the full structure. So they break up the problem into little pieces, and then they work on each piece, and they sort of piecemeal it back together. So, this is the, like, the simplest complex causal reasoning problem I could come up with is when you have two causes and a, an effect. Well, according to the structurally local idea, you would reason about one of these relationships, so the cause one and the effect. And then you might go reason about the other relationship, the effect, or the cause two and the effect. And then you would go back and you would piecemeal these together. So then you would um, come up with a judgment about the effect based on um, individual judgments about each relationship. Well, the quantum um, probability theory provides a way to formalize this idea of structurally local causal reasoning by using incompatible events that form multiple pasted together sample spaces. So at the beginning, I gave you a couple of reasons why I thought people might adopt an incompatible representation. And one of those was in situations with a lot of uncertainty where you don't have a lot of past experience, you might break up a problem into multiple sample spaces and have incompatible events. So this is what I'm hypothesizing is going on here. So when you have these more complex causal reasoning problems, you break up the problem into these elemental causal units. So Basically, I can think about cause one and the effect, 
and I form a compatible representation for this um, relationship. And then I can think about cause two and the effect, and I form a compatible representation to think about this. And then I have to sort of chain them together or piece them together in a coherent way in order to then think about the probability of the effect overall. So a bit more concretely, if I have two incompatible um, causal relations, I have cause one and um, the effect, cause two and the effect, so I'm treating these as incompatible. Well, causes can either be present or absent and effects can exist or they cannot exist. So that gives me four possible events. I can have the effect and it be present, the effect and it be absent, et cetera. And I can then think about two different bases for the four dimensional vector space corresponding to the two incompatible cause effect relationships. So I have a basis when I'm thinking about cause one and the effect. I have a separate basis when I'm thinking about cause two and the effect. So this would imply that for a single relationship, if I'm treating things in a compatible way, then this can easily, um, is, is consistent with most of the classical probability work that's been done with elemental causal induction. It's just when I start chaining more things together that I need to use multiple sample spaces that are then pasted together in a certain way. So if we're hypothesizing that incompatible um, cause effect relationships um, exist, then we should get order effects in these more complex causal reasoning problems because incompatible events have to be processed in a sequence and we would expect order effects to naturally arise. So we developed a new experiment to test for order effects. And what we were looking at is the probability of the effect given cause one, then cause two, whether or not it's equal to the probability of the effect given cause two and then cause one. So in this experiment, we had 113 people read 10 causal scenarios involving a single effect and two causes. One of the causes was present and one was absent. And then we asked them to report the likelihood of the effect between zero and one. And we did this very similarly to the criminal inference uh, experiment where we had them do it before reading either cause, after reading one of the causes, and then again after reading the last cause. So this is just an example of one of the questions I asked. So the effect would be, um, what's the probability you think the sales of a popular caffeine-free soda will increase next year? And so they give me some rating. They just come up with a number. And then I say, OK, now I tell you that the soda company lowers the price of the drink. Now what's the probability that the sales of the popular caffeine-free soda drink will increase? And so they provide me with another rating. And then they might see the absent cause, which is the, buzz, um, the advertising buzz, uh, budget stays the same. And then they provide another uh, rating after this information. So here I've got the probability um, of uh, the effect for each of the three points in time, before the causes, after the first cause, and after the second cause. So the dotted line is the present cause followed by the absent cause. And the solid line is the absent cause followed by the present cause. And what we see again is we get this recency effect um, in this situation. So if we, there was no order effect, then these would end up on the same point, And we wouldn't see this cross in the graph. So this is some preliminary evidence that maybe order effects exist in causal reasoning. And maybe that's due to this sort of incompatible representation that's adopted in this sort of chaining together of causal, um, elemental causal relationships. Um, I think a lot more experimental work is needed here. And at the very end, I'm going to um, discuss that a bit. So we can model this. And what we do is we have an initial state here, um, the omegas. And we're going to then have a basis that corresponds to the cause one effect relationship. And that's the alphas here. We learn that cause one is present. So we project onto the present subspace. And then if I learn that cause two was absent, then I move from my bases that I'm using for my cause one effect relationship to my cause two effect relationship. That's my betas. And then I project onto cause two. And so I use both of these um, states here for producing probabilities of the effect. I'm going to point out that 
all of the models I'm talking about are using a particular unitary operator to rotate between the bases. This unitary operator, the form of it uh, is the same for all of the examples I've shown you. And it's very similar to unitary matrices that have been used um, by Pothos and Bussemeyer in their pr prisoner's dilemma model. And also um, in some recent work in trying to model uh, violations of dynamic consistency. So we always try to use the same operator here so we're consistent. So we have a psychological theory about where this operator comes from. There's a free parameter in it that we're fitting here to this data. But other than that, the form of it is the same. So these are just fits to the model. So on the first row I have a situation when you see present and then absent. Bottom row you see absent, um, the absent cause and then the present cause the data and the model after the first judgment, the data and the model after the second judgment. And you can see that these are very similar. So the model is doing a pretty good job at fitting the data. I'm going to briefly talk about another application here. Um, yeah. Can you just say something? So you said there are a couple of free parameters in there that presumably affect how big the order effect is. Um, so it's, it's determining the rotation. Um, so they're being fit. So this is. I mean, if there was no rotation, there would be no order effect, right? Um, if there was no rotation, we would be using the same bases. And that would be the same as at least a simple classical model um, in which we can't get the order out of unless we add it in some other way. So, so am I right that basically you have a parameter that turns up and down the order effect, um, which is the, the angle between the two bases? Yeah, it's, it, 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 it does that, but it's, it's a little, it's probably doing something a bit more complicated than just turning it up and down. So, um, but more or less, it's, 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 it's showing the relationship between the bases. But I mean, the thing I should take away here is you can predict an order effect. It probably shouldn't take away the exact numerical fit because yeah, one number. Yeah, right. I mean, this is actually, I mean, there's two free parameters, there's four data points here. This is not very informative. I mean, the point is that the model with this idea can work. And I'm going to talk about some future experiments, which will hopefully provide better test of all of this. All right, so this is another um, application. And this was uh, something that was studied by Phil Fernbach and Steve Sloman. And they looked at comparing predictive and diagnostic causal judgments. So predictive judgments when you provide the probability of an effect given a cause, diagnostic um, uh, causal problem is where you have the probability of cause given an effect. And so what they did was they looked at predictive and diagnostic judgments with full and no alternative conditionals. So a predictive full conditional would be something like Mrs. Y has depression. What is the likelihood that she presents with lethargia? The predictive no alternative conditional would be Mrs. Y has depression. She has not been diagnosed with any other medical or psychiatric disorder. What that would, could cause lethargia, what is the likelihood she presents with lethargia? So basically, in the no alternative conditional, you're just adding in the sentence that there's no other cause of her being lethargic. And a similar um, situation for the diagno um, diagnostic um, conditional. And so we might expect the following two relationships. So we might expect that the probability of the effect given the cause should be greater than the probability of the effect given um, the cause and no alternative causes. Because in this situation here, where we just have the cause, there could be other alternative causes causing the effect. So if anything, we might think that this one should be larger than this situation where we rule out all other possible causes for the effect. And in the other direction, so in the diagnostic direction, we would assume or predict that the probability of the cause given the effect is less than the probability of the cause given the effect and no alternative causes. So when we say there are no alternative causes, that means the, if the effect exists, then this must be what's causing it. So this probability judgment should be higher than in this situation where there could be other alternative causes which could explain the effect. And these are the results of the experiment. So what they found is there's no difference for predictive judgments. So the full and no alternative conditional um, was basically the same. For diagnostic judgments, people tend to get it in the right direction so that the probability of the full conditional is less than the probability of the no alternative conditional. So the question is, um, you know, why this? And so we use the same model assuming in this situation that 
our two causes were, if we have the cause, the explicitly defined cause, what is the likelihood um, or she has depression? And then the absent kind of implicit cause is that the she ha doesn't have anything else. There's no other problems that could be causing um, her to be lethargic. So we're using the same sort of setup where we have, um, we're treating these simple causal relations as compatible, but the separate causal relationships as incompatible. And so again, we fit the model to the state and it can capture this um, sort of pattern of results. So what you're looking at here is the diagnostic judgment type and then the predictive judgment type on the bottom line and this full conditional and then the no alternative conditional, um, the data and the model, the model does a pretty decent job of capturing that data. But again, I mean, I say with a word of caution, we have two free parameters and four data points. So, um, so with that, I'm going to talk quickly about uh, some future directions. So I want to develop some new experiments to test these order effects and causal reasoning because we need um, a lot more data to really examine this model. So we're going to, I'm working on developing some experiments in where we look at uh, a lot of different causal scenarios. So not just two causes and effect, but maybe the causes interact, or maybe we have a chain of causes. And then we ask both predictive and diagnostic judgments, and we manipulate maybe both of the causes are present, maybe one's present, one is absent. And so we look at all different combinations of possibilities here, and we gather data on that to provide a rich data set um, to examine this model and to explore whether order effects are actually occurring. So the other point is um, we think that maybe we might see a reduction in order effects with experience. So cause-effect relationships are incompatible because individuals don't have a wealth of past experience with complex causal structures. That's what we're assuming. So if you gain experience, then maybe your incompatible representation might be replaced with a, uh, with a compatible one. So maybe you move from having these separate, separate um, uh, sample spaces that are pasted together in this way to using a compatible representation so to use a larger sample space. And then ultimately what we would like to do is then do a Bayesian model comparison between the quantum causal reasoning model and some of the other classical causal reasoning models that have been proposed. And in particular with this second experiment up here where we're looking at experience and whether or not we see a reduction in order effects, what I'm thinking we might see is if we did this Bayesian model comparison is we would see favoritism for the quantum model early on in the experiment, so in the earlier trials, and then might actually switch so that the classical model might be preferred later on in the trials after a lot of learning if they're actually moving to a more compatible representation. Okay, with that, I want to thank you and open it for questions. <laughs> got one question that was asked uh, in, in a slightly different way. Um, there is a parameter, as you mentioned, um, in your unity transformation. What's the interpretation of that parameter? Um, this is something that we want to explore further and try to understand exactly what yeah, well, does it make some sort of ordinal sense? That is, if you, uh, if you start off at, at zero, you're at the identity. You, you're at the neutral state. Well, these, and as you increase it, you move away from that neutral well, state. Well, these parameters, I mean, the parameter spaces are oscillatory. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated because we have to maybe talk about then a range of looking at the parameter. And then I think Jerome's starting to do some of this work in, with param Bayesian parameter estimation uh, to have a better understanding of what these parameters actually do. But it's, I don't think you're going to get an ordinal relationship if you have an oscillation are like that. Are these parameters telling about the orientation of the other bases? Yeah. They are. So yeah. Words, uh, but, so then his question, uh, the question is an answer telling you how far off are these different uh, interpretations because you're, you know, you've got your vector S, and so what you're doing is you're projecting it uh, into these different bases, and that's your unitary uh, mapping, et cetera. And what the extra parameter is just the orientation of the bases. So when you have three of them, you've got five extra parameters running around. Because you've got three of them, you put the x-axis, and you've got two more, then you get the y. Yeah. 
And so uh, a little bit bothers me is the number of extra parameters. I don't view the extra parameters as bad. I think it's getting sharp results. So, you should get a lot of extra parameters. She doesn't no, I don't have those extra parameters. No, I'm talking if you have three, uh, three dimensions, uh, two dimensions, you only have one parameter. No, she has four. I have four dimensions, and I have. Um, so we define what the unitary yeah. operator is, and I didn't put it up here. And we're using the same unitary operator. So we came up with a psychological theory about what that unitary operator is. And then we use that same unitary operator in pretty much all of the experimental work that we've done so far where we're tr using um, a Hermitian matrix. And then there's a parameter in there that, I mean, is, is a multiplicative parameter across um, the unitary operator. So we don't have as many parameters as you're actually saying. So we've. Okay, well, in a future presentation, I'd like to see what is that unitary operator, why you believe that, because that cuts down significantly the number of parameters. That right. Mm -hmm. can, can I just slightly pursue this? So I'm at a neutral state, and the prosecutor begins to take that example. The prosecutor begins to give me ev evidence. Can I imagine that I'm now beginning to move away from the unit matrix, I'm a unitary matrix, and I'm moving away. I'm starting to make this rotation, OK? As I add more evidence, do, more, do I move further away? Well, that's, I mean, that's not how my model works. But I, I mean, this is a dynamical model that you're talking about. Um, and this would be a, a, probably the direction I think that we should start to move in, because you're right. So when you're starting to read, evidence you do have, I mean, it's an online process. Um, so we would like to think that this model is accounting for that kind of dynamic change of belief state. You're moving from a state in the vector space yep. to, let's say, a, yep. guilt, a guilty space. And you're rotating right. in that, right. that four-dimensional space. And, and, and it seems intuitively that this can be very smooth. Yeah, yeah it's smooth, but, but it, the, this four-dimensional space is a complex space. But it's smooth. It is smooth. It's, it's, it's basically the Schrodinger equation. So it's a differential equation. It's right. Smooth. So I, I want to pursue this intuition. If the prosecution adds more and more and more evidence, you are saying, in your own words, that the case is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Right? OK. And at each point in that chain of prosecutorial evidence, you have a point in the vector space that corresponds to how far you've rotated. And this is a smooth process, right? Mm -hmm. What prevents me from thinking of this parameter as a measure of strength? How much evidence? It can oscillate. It can oscillate. So. I know. And that's the issue. It'll oscillate you are, the point. You're taking data. Let's suppose the prosecutor gives a good, strong case, and the probability of guilt at the end of the day is 0.9. OK? Mm -hmm. And you draw a probability, so to speak, at 0.9 as you're tracking the orbit of your unitary uh, subgroup. You're going to get multiple crossings. Which means, as I'm adding evidence, the probability of guilt is going up and down. Well, that and I'm picking off a particular point. Yeah, but that depends on whether or not how much you're going to move. And you, you have to map that movement. You have evidence, you're mapping the movement. It could be moving less and less and less until it converges at that point. No, there's no convergence. I mean, if you keep moving at the same, if you keep moving, if you have a, a, an increment of evidence delta, and then you move a delta and move a delta, you'll cross over and it'll start oscillating around it. But if you're assuming you're getting delta and a smaller delta and a smaller delta, then you stop. Jerry, we both agree that the orbit itself is smooth. Yeah. It, but what's that, oscillating is, is the probability. The evidence is not smooth. Evidence is, is a discrete thing. You're presenting a discrete amount of evidence. And that's, well, that evidence is going to psychologically become a smaller step towards that point in that of guilt in that vector space. It's hard for me to understand as the prosecutor goes on and keeps adding bullet points, which you yourself distinguish between strong and weak. Right. So more bullet points, stronger. Yes. Okay? 
Now, if those additional bullet points corresponding correspond to incremental rotations, right, which is also what I think you're saying, how can I lower my probability, which is what your model is doing for you? It will move it towards it, but it can overshoot it and come back to you and oscillate. It will oscillate around that point. And, my, and the size of the oscillations might depend upon the parameters. Actually, well, oh, I, I, I think it, I feel it's a pure question too, and there indeed has some evidence in psychology. If you have really strong evidence, sometimes people start to call it arguing. Actually, sometimes there is some people call um, backfiring or boomeraging effect. There actually it's quite um, in narrative persuasion in psych social psychology work. They do show sometimes overly strong evidence can be can be bad. But you so I don't use that know. as a reason to drop classical probability theory. Right. Yeah. It's so not so that like a religion. So I, I, I think don't get it. Oh. You know, I mean, there are true believers okay. versus the. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she's just describing a result. It's yeah. not a religion. She's describing an empirical result. No, but your model, if you look at your model and track it, so and I'm sure you've done happen. this on a computer screen, as you. Yeah, I've done that. And it oscillates around, around the point, like 0.9. It oh. oscillates like point, point oh, 0.8. Oh, oh, oh. But point the oscillations aren't damping. You're not converging. No, they don't, they don't damp, but they oscillate. Now you can get damping by putting noise in the system. So there's more complicated quantum models we haven't discussed here. With damping, will converge. Decoherence will make it converge. So you can get a, you can get a system that's that's growing towards that equilibrium point these shots she has. But if it's a if there's quantum noise just coming in each step, it'll decohere and converge on a point. I don't think that's a feature of the actual model. No, it's presented. not a feature of this model. It's not a feature. No. But you can build you can build it in so it doesn't oscillate if you want. You can build in a decoherence <coughs> model that stops oscillating. But in these kind of models, they will oscillate, but they'll oscillate around a high level of confidence. So it's an empirical question, I guess. Do people's confidence actually oscillate? I mean, you're assuming a Markov model where it goes towards an equilibrium and stays there. And, and maybe it does. That our, this theory will be wrong. But we don't know, because nobody looks at the time course of confidence really closely to see if there's any kind of oscillation in there. And what she's pointing out, sometimes you present too much strong evidence, you get backfire. So it's an empirical test, no religion at all. You don't get a monotonic all the time. But anyone. Okay. I think we should, uh, <laughs> uh, this,